Hello, my name is Burkhard Schipper. I'm an associate professor of economics at the University of California in Davis and I teach you intermediate microeconomics. Today we will start with consumer theory. The basic assumption of consumer theory is that consumers are not too stupid. That is, they try to select the best consumption bundle subject to the budget constraint. Now, behind me on my computer screen there is a very nice car. It is a Mercedes-Benz SLS. Now my question to you is, why don't you own this car? This is actually meant as a serious question. Now your most likely answer is that you cannot afford this car. And this is exactly the topic of chapter 2, which is entitled Budget Constraints. We want to have a simple model of budget constraints. To this extent I will consider two goods. Uh, by x1 I denote the amount of good 1. So x1 is a real number greater than 0 because we consume only positive amounts of, of goods. So here the, a positive amount of good 1. And um, by x2 I denote the amount of good 2. Now a consumption bundle will be denoted by the vector x1, x2 where x1 is the amount of good 1 that I consume and x2 is the amount of good 2 that I consume. So the subscript always indicates the good. So 1 for good 1, 2 for good 2. Actually it may be better to say this is a bundle of amounts of good 1 and good 2. Now these bundles we can uh, depict in a coordinate system where on the x-axis we simply denote the amount of good 1 and on the y-axis we simply denote the amount of good 2. So any point in this coordinate system is a possible um, consumption bundle. So in particular um, I have here the consumption bundle x1, x2, this blue consumption bundle, where this is the amount of x1 that I demand in this consumption bundle and this is the amount of good 2 that I demand in this consumption bundle. So again any point in this coordinate system is a consumption bundle. Now the question I want to ask is which bundles of goods can the consumer afford? Now this will depend not only on the on the on the goods that he on on the amount of good one and good two that he consumes, but it will also depend on the prices that he has to pay for for, for these goods and on his income. So by P1 I denote the price of one unit of good one. So P1 is again a real number greater than zero and P2 is the price of one unit of good two. Now the last ingredient that I need is M. M is the money available for consumption. So this is our income or the income of the consumer. Okay. Now this income may have uh, may come in several forms. Of course you may simply have cash income okay um, but you may also have uh, credit cards if you buy things so what, what is here really the money available for consumption well you can think of it as your your your, your credit limit essentially so so the assumption here is that every consumer knows um, his his budget um, and uh, and there is a hard budget constraint so there um, there is basically a, a limit um, to what, uh, what he can spend on consumption. Okay. Now um, we want to consider um, the amount of money that he spends on good one. So this we can actually um, um, denote by this term. So x1 is the amount of good one that he consumes and p1 is the price of one unit of good one. So p1 times x1 is then the amount of money that he would spend on good one. Similarly, okay, so this is the amount of, um, so this is the spending on good one. Similarly, we can uh, think of the spending on good two. So this is the price for good two times the quantity for good two. So this is how many units of good two he demands times the price of good two. So this is his total spending on good two. Now if we if we add these two terms up, since there are only two goods that we consider, so this is the spending on good one, this is the spending on good two, so then this sum, the sum of these two terms is the total spending of the consumer, because there are no other goods as we assume, so there are only two goods. 
Um, so, so now we have the total spending of the consumer. And, well, if you look at how much he spends, okay, well, how much he spends is constrained by the money ha he has available for consumption, so we, we must have that this sum is um, weekly smaller than his income or the, than his uh, money available for consumption. So this is his budget inequality. Okay, and now we can have an answer for the question I raised above. So, uh, which bundles of goods can the consumer afford? Well, the consumer can afford all bundles of goods x1, x2 that satisfy this inequality. Okay, so given prices and income, um, we can look at all bundles x1, x2 uh, such that this inequality is satisfied. Okay. So this inequality means that you know what he spends should be less than his income or weekly less than his income. Now we can think about uh, how we could depict this budget inequality in this coordinate system. Okay, so how would this look like in this coordinate system? Now in order to depict this in this coordinate system I will first consider a simpler problem, namely I look at this equality. Now the only thing I did is I replaced this inequality, this weak inequality with equality. And this means the following that basically what I spend on good one plus what I spend on good two should be equal my income. Okay, so so there is no slack, there there is no no income left after I consume. So I, I exhaust my entire income or my entire budget I exhaust. If I can if I consume a consumption bundle X1, X2 that satisfy this equality, then I exhaust then my consumption and then my consumption exhausts my entire income. Okay? Now if you look at this equality, this is actually a linear equation. Okay, so we have x2, we have x1, um, so it's it's a linear equation. Um, so we know that it must be some kind of line here. Okay, so some straight line. We, we just don't know how this line looks like. Now, the question is, um, how can we think about this line in this coordinate system? In particular, we may want to think it. Uh, we, we may want to think about where does this where, where where does this line? intersect with the x1 axis and where does it intersect with the x2 axis? If it intersects. I mean it should intersect somewhere. Okay. So um, so how can we how we how can we get these intercepts or these these intersections? Well uh, one thing to note is that um, um, one thing to note is that if we look at the intersection with the x1 axis then um, at any point here, we know that the consumption of, in terms of good two, must be zero, okay? Because uh, the origin of the coordinate system is zero. So any point here must mean that we consume zero in terms of good two, okay? So what we can do is we can rewrite this equality and put zero for good for the amount of good two, okay? So then our equality becomes P1 times X1 plus P2 times 0 equals M. Now, if this is 0 here, then uh, since it's multiplied with some number, okay, so it's uh, this term must be 0 as well. Okay, so I can simplify this simply to P1 times X1 equals M. Now, uh, we can simply solve this for X1 by dividing um, both sides with P1. And what do we get? We get x1 equals m over p1. So basically the intersection here of the budget line um, with respect to the x, uh, x1 axis is simply m over p1. Okay? So this could be here for example. This could be m over p1. So it will depend on the income and on the price of good 1. A similar exercise we can do for 2. Okay, so if we if we want to look at the intersection with the x2 axis, um, same procedure. A at any point here at the x2 axis, we must know that the co in, uh, the consumption of good one must be zero because the, the origin of the coordinate system is zero. So uh, we can 
we can put in for, for x1, for the amount of good 1, we simply, um, we simply substitute this amount of good 1 with 0. Then we have p1 times 0 plus p2 times x2 equals m. Now, since here is 0, then this term, which is simply just multiplied, which is 0 multiplied by p1, this term must be 0 as well. So then uh, this simplifies to p2 times x2 equals m. And we solve for x2 to get x2 equals m over p2. So now we can um, depict this on this x2 axis. And this could be, for example, here. And now we know the intersection of this line, okay, of this linear. Um, so th it's a linear equation, so there must be a line. So we, we know the intersection of this line um, that reflects the budget um, line um, with the x1 and x2 axis. So it could look like this. So this is our budget line, okay, in this case. Okay, so our budget line could look like this blue line here. Okay, so now that we um, know the, the intercepts uh, with the x1 axis and the x2 axis, uh, we also want to know the slope of the budget line. Okay, so um, how can we get the slope of the budget line? Well, uh, one way of getting the slope of the budget line is simply to look at this uh, equation and uh, realize it's a linear um, it's a linear equation, so if you know linear equations, you know what is the slope. Um, one other way, one other simple way is to see, okay, look, uh, the slope is negative, certainly. So it's actually the, the relation, um, so it's, it's this distance relative to that distance. So, uh, so basically 0 minus this distance and uh, then this distance minus 0. So um, the way we can ri write it is um, as follows, so we can have a minus, because it's negative, okay, m over p2, so this is um, this length, and then um, um, this is relative to m over p1, so m over p1 is this one, okay. So, um, of course, we can simplify this because we have m in the nominator and m in the denominator. And uh, so this simplifies, we cancel m and we get uh, minus 1 over p2 over 1 over p1. Now, uh, so this is a fraction divided by a fraction, so we can um, rewrite this by noticing that, okay, we can simply then multiply with the reciproc of this fraction. So what we get is then minus 1 over p2, that's the same as here, times p1 over 1. And uh, of course we can simplify this further um, because we don't need these ones here, so uh, we simply then write minus p1 over p2. And uh, this is the slope of the budget line, so this is our slope. Okay. So um, originally, we started actually um, we sta st started with with our budget inequality and not with the budget line. So we want want to know uh, what is uh, wha what are the uh, consumption bundles x1, x2 that satisfy this budget inequality. Now, one simple way of uh, seeing this is that okay, if we have our budget line, um, then we know that for any points on this budget line, for, for example this point here, uh, we know that we exhaust our budget, so we spend all of our income for consumption. Now if you would consume less in terms of good 2, so if you reduce consumption of good 2, then we move basically downwards, it could be this kind of consumption bundle here. If you reduce uh, our consumption of good 2, then uh, presumably we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't spend our entire income. Okay, so because uh, if we if we reduce consumption of good two, then uh, before we spend everything, now we reduce consumption of good two, so we would spend less. Okay, so at this consumption bundle where I have my my red pointer, um, at this consumption bundle we would not exhaust our budget. So, in particular, then this consumption bundle would satisfy our uh, budget inequality. So we can generalize this observation. Uh, by realizing that basically essentially any point in this triangle here, so any point in this triangle here is a consumption bundle or represents a consumption bundle where we satisfy this budget inequality. 
and in particular the special cases when we satisfy this budget inequality uh, this budget weak inequality with equality so then uh, this would be a point on this budget line there we would satisfy it with equality okay but any point below the budget line in this uh, blue triangle um, is basically a consumption bundle where we would satisfy this budget inequality okay and this this set this blue um, triangle is called the budget set so any consumption bundle in the budget set is in our budget so is is basically possibly consu to consume because we we don't uh, we don't overspend okay so we are still within our budget okay so it would satisfy our budget constraint now um, one question you may want to ask is uh, so far we just considered two goods Okay, so why do we only consider two goods? What, what, what would justify that we consider just two goods? Um, now, I want to give you two answers. Okay, uh, one kind of um, I would say um, answer by essentially saying okay, it's for simplicity, and another one, um, uh, it's more conceptual answer. Okay, so the first answer is okay. Look, um, we want to build a simple model of budget constraints, and um, two goods are often enough. Okay, so um, in particular, what I most of what I say actually in this course will generalize to more than two goods. Okay, but uh, we can illustrate everything with two goods already. So then, um, you know, why, uh, why why not just look at two goods to to make it clear and to keep it simple and in particular to be able to um, illustrate it uh, with uh, the simple coordinate systems that we in introduced okay so, so now if we if we would consider more than two goods um, we could for example consider also three goods um, so here we have a budget inequality with three goods the, it's basically the same as before but I add an additional term on the left hand side we have now good 3 and now x3 would um, uh, denote the amount of um, good 3 and p3 is the price for one unit of good 3 and now the budget inequality should satisfy that the total spending so the total spending is the spending on good 1 plus the spending on good 2 plus the spending on on good 3 should be weakly smaller than the income that is available for consumption now I write this here with three goods I could have written this with n goods by adding more terms but I write this here with three goods because with three goods we can s still depict it with pictures okay so um, here's our um, a diagram that we introduced before where we have the amount of good one and the amount of good two and now if you have the amount of good three we have to add one axis okay so uh, here is another axis where we have the amount of good three and now how would the budget line look like well the, the budget line would then s be simply represented by a plane okay by, by this triangle okay so so in any two dimensions it's a it's a line okay so you can understand it as before okay so this would be in the dimension of x1 and x2 this would be in the dimension of x1 and x3 and this would be in the dimension x2 and x3 um, so in any two dimensions you can understand it as we um, as the as the two goods case um, and now if we if we take all three co goods together and we look at consumption bundles uh, that are completely mixed so where we can consume known trivial amounts or known zero amounts of good one good two and good three then uh, this would be a point on this plane okay and uh, on any any point on this plane we would exhaust our budget we would spend all of our income available for consumption and the budget set then would be this kind of pyramid okay so this um, where, where each side is a triangle okay so this pyramid then is our budget set in the case of uh, three goods now for n goods so for for more than three goods it's basically not possible anymore to depict it in these in these diagrams because you know um, a plane is two dimensional but you know um, we can do this in three dimensions as and as in this picture here but in more dimensions it's hard to depict um, we, we can still think about it so then the, the budget line 
uh, in the n-dimensional case would be a hyperplane. So it would, it would be called a hyperplane, but but you cannot you cannot depict it anymore with with some pictures like this. So the one reason why we consider only two goods is because um, most of what I say in this course generalizes to more than two goods, and um, and then um, uh, one big advantage of just looking at two goods is that we can uh, often basically illustrate uh, what uh, what we do with this. Um, with these coordinate systems where we have just uh, two goods. Okay, so this is one answer why we just consider two. Another answer is um, so so one uh, the second answer is that um, that uh, we can consider good two as a composite good. Okay, so I have to tell you what is a composite good. Well, a composite good and here in, uh, good two would be the composite good. Um, a composite good would mean that this is the money spent on all other goods. So essentially, when we think about many goods, we can divide them into one good that we want to analyze, so the consumption for one good that we want to analyze, and uh, all the other goods, so the spending on all the other goods. And now we take the, the good two simply as the amount of money spent on all other goods. Okay, so, so 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 this is not the the units of all other goods. Okay, like uh, three units of good two, uh, four units of good three, or something like this. We don't add up these kind of things, but we 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 add up the spending on all other goods. Okay, um, so in this case, of course, then uh, the price for this good two, so the price for this composite good would be one. Why is it one? Well, because um, good 2 should represent the money spent on all other goods. So it's denoted already in money. In, in so in For example, if you think about dollars, it would be denoted in dollar terms. Now what's the price of a dollar? Well, the price of one dollar is exactly one dollar. Okay, so so then the, 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 the price for this coup, good 2, uh, this composite good, would be, uh, would be one, because it is already denoted in, in money terms. Okay, so 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 this is a this is another answer why we consider two goods because we're often interested in basically analyzing one good relative to the spending on all other goods, and in this case the price for this all other goods for this um, composite good would be two um, wo no, wo would be one. Okay. Okay. Now s since we since we discuss already some kind of special goods like the composite good, um, I want to introduce um, another notion of a good, which is the numeraire. So sometimes we consider one good to be the numeraire. What is the numeraire? Well, a numeraire is a good in which we denote the prices of other goods. Okay. So how can we think about this? Well. Um, um, think about our budget equation. So here I write down our budget inequality, okay, so P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2 is smaller or equal M, okay, and now I could say, okay, um, so I have here price of good 1, price of good 2, uh, what I could do is I could divide both sides by the price of good 2, for instance, okay, then this is, this is basically the same equation as here, I just basically divide both sides by P2 and then I have here P1 over P2 times X1 plus, and now there's no P2 anymore because it cancels, and then uh, we have smaller, equal so we have here X2 only left, and then we have, uh, this is smaller equal M over P2 because we divide both sides by P2. Now wha what, do, wha what would it mean? Well this is actually the price of good 1 denoted in terms of good 2 okay and this is the income denoted in terms of good 2 so how many so at prices at, at these prices how how many uh, goods good 2 would make up my income okay and this is um, how many units of good 2 uh, i would need to buy a good 1 to, to buy one unit of good one, okay. Um, so in this case, when we do like this, then we take good two to be the numeraire because we denote now um, everything uh, in terms of good two, okay. Our income is denoted in ter terms of good two, and also the price for good one is denoted in terms of 
um, in terms of good two. Okay, so the numeraire is a good in which we denote the prices of other goods, and, th and there's always the possibility to take one good as a numeraire if you want to. Okay, so um, okay, so repeat, and so I repeat. Okay, in this case here we have uh, that good two is the numeraire. One example for numeraire comes from Germany after the Second World War. After the Second World War, there, there were bills around from that time. But people couldn't really buy something for it because th there was not much to buy. So people resorted to barter trade. Barter trade is trade by, is, is trade goods against goods. Now one particular good people liked to trade was cigarettes. They're relatively small and easy to handle. So they took over somehow the function of money to a certain extent at least. So you could even denote prices in number of cigarettes. So cigarettes became the numeraire. Now cigarettes are a very nice currency in some sense because when, when you have inflation of cigarettes, so the, the value of cigarettes goes down because there are too many cigarettes, then people would simply smoke more because smoking became cheaper and uh, the price of cigarettes would appreciate and uh, so inflation would be kept in check by the smoking of the people. Now, the point I want to make is um, that whenever you have barter trade, then often you have a numeraire. And um, yeah, so cigarettes after the Second World War in Germany is, is one example. We want to study changes of the budget set. In particular, we want to see how the budget set changes when we change prices or when we change the income. The first change I want to consider is uh, the change of the income and in particular I want to see how an increase of the income from M to M prime with M prime being bigger than M how this would affect our budget set. So how can we think about well um, we can we can look at what could be affected by a change of the income so first of all the intercept here with the x1 axis depends on m. So when we change m we would expect that this intercept changes. Similarly the intercept with the x2 axis will depend on uh, depends on m so when we change m we expect that this will change as well. Okay. So in particular when we increase from m to m prime then since m is in the denominator we would expect that the whole fraction will become bigger as well. So then um, the intercept may change from here to here. Okay, so this would be m prime over p1. Um, similar when we when we look at um, good two, so here the m m is in the in the denominator of this fraction. So when we increase m we would expect that the entire fraction increases and it may be um, actually here so it will change by the same factor. Okay, and then the um, the budget line will move outwards, so it has these new new intercepts. So it may look like this. Okay, so so this may be now our new budget line. Okay, so when we have an increase of the income, of course, uh, we can now afford more um, more bundles. In particular, we can afford all the old bundles that, that we could afford before. Okay, so the the budget set becomes bigger if we have more income to spend. Okay, so the, the new budget set is a superset of the old budget set. Okay. The next thing I want to consider um, are changes uh, to prices and um, I want to focus here first on, um, on changes to the price for good one. Uh, in particular I want to look at an increase of the price for good one to the price P1 prime. Okay, so and p1 prime is strictly bigger than p1. We can look at what, what what could change. So first of all, the intercept here with the x1 axis depends on p1. Also, the slope depends on p1, but the intercept with the x2 axis does not depend on p1. So we would expect that the slope changes and that um, that the intercept with the x1 axis change. 
So how could the intercept change? Well, since um, since um, P1 is in the denominator of this fraction, we would expect that if the price increases for the good one, that the fraction becomes smaller, so it will move towards the left. Uh, similarly, when we look at um, the slope, in the slope P1 is in the denominator, so if P1 increases, we would expect the slope to be steeper. So the new budget line should basically have a look like this. It's steeper and uh, the intercept basically is, is towards the left. Okay, and this is the new slope now with minus P1 prime over P2. Okay, so of course when um, a good becomes more expensive then this is usually worse for the consumer because he can consume now uh, less. So there, 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 there are certain consumption bundles that he could have consumed before that he cannot consume anymore. Okay, in particular consumption bundles like here, so this consumption bundle where I have my, my red pointer, um, this he could have consumed before, but he cannot consume anymore, he cannot afford it anymore, it's outside the budget set. And the new budget set is a subset of the old budget set. The next thing I want to consider is what happens when we change the prices of both goods. Okay, so now we, we want to change the price of good 1 and good 2. Um, and we want to change these prices by the same factor. So I want to increase these prices by a factor t, and t is strictly bigger than 1. So then the new price after the price increase would be t times p1. p1 is the old price. And um, the new price for good 2 would be t times p2, which uh, where p2 was the old price. Okay, so now the new price is t times p2. And remember, so t is strictly bigger than 1, so we look at the price increase. So what can happen? Well, um, we, can, we can rewrite the budget equation, uh, the, the budget inequality after the price increase. So the budget inequality after the price increase would be t times p1 times x1. So this would be the spending on good 1 after the price increase. And then we have t times p2 times x2 this would be the spending on good 2 after the price increase. So then what is on the left side is the total spending after the price increase. And of course the total spending after the price increase should be less than uh, the money income that is available for consumption. Okay, so he cannot spend more than he has. Now when we, when we look at this inequality we can divide um, both sides by t Okay, what do we get? Then we get uh, the following, we get P1 times X1 plus P2 times X2, that, that's basically the old spending, essentially, before the price increase. And um, on the other side we have M divided by T. Okay, and this M divided by T we make simply call now M prime, so we give it a new name. And then we notice that actually M prime is now strictly smaller than M. Okay, because we divide by something that is bigger than 1. Okay. So this inequality is the same as this inequality. So this means that we can understand uh, the increase of both prices as a corresponding decrease of the income. Okay, because so these budget inequalities are the same. Okay, they're they're equivalent, and um, and then so here we have the price increase. Okay. But uh, since they are equivalent, it also tells us okay, it's, um, we can consider it as a as an income decrease. Okay, so and we know basically how the budget line changes with the income already. Uh, it's basically a parallel movement. Okay, so it moves up or down, but it stays parallel. Okay, so in particular, if m prime now is smaller than m, we would expect that um, the intercept uh, moves towards the left. Also the intercept with the x1 axis moves towards the left and the intercept with the x2 axis moves downwards because we have now less income. Okay? So then the, the new intercepts may be, um, may be um, here, okay? so this, this would be m prime over p1 and this is m prime over p2, so it changes by the same factor and the new budget line uh, is now this line. Okay? So the, the new budget set okay, is a subset of the original budget set. Okay. Now there are a couple of applications for studying these price changes or this um, income changes. Uh, one application are taxes and subsidies. So let's try to um, get an idea what kind of taxes are there and subsidies. 
Um, one tax um, is the quantity tax. Okay, so the quantity tax uh, for good one would work as follows. So, so you would have to pay the price for good one plus T. And T is now a positive number and this T is uh, paid basically for each unit of good one that you purchase. So it's charged on the quantity of good one. So how many um, um, so it depends on how many quantities of good one you purchase. Okay, so this is a quantity tax. Now one one um, one example of a quantity tax is the gas tax. Um, so in California currently we pay 71.9 cents per gallon uh, on on gas as as tax. Okay, so so this is um, this is a quantity tax. Now similar to taxes, we can also consider subsidies. Okay. Uh, a quantity subsidy would be then uh, P1 minus T. Okay, so here I, I basically uh, subtract this T. So this would be a subsidy because I essentially have to pay less. In particular, I have to pay T per unit of um, consumption of good one less. Okay. Another type of taxes uh, we know or we, we meet every day is the va value-added tax and the value-added tax basically increases the price of the good by a factor. So here we increase the price for good one by a factor one plus tau and tau is the tax rate and uh, tau of course is then uh, uh, la larger than zero. And one example of of a value-added value tax that you meet almost every day is the sales tax. So in, in Davis currently the sales tax is 8%. Um, so um, yeah, so, the, so sales taxes are charged in many countries. In Germany it's 19% currently um, and in, man, in many places in Euro Europe uh, it's, it's about 19%. Um, so the value-added tax may, may actually change from country to country, but it may also change um, within um, within states in the U.S., for example. So every county has a slightly different um, uh, uh, sales tax rate. Um, and even in Davis, for example, we have two different sales taxes because on campus um, we charge actually a lower sales tax at 7.5 percent, whereas in the in the city of Davis uh, the sales tax is 8 percent outside the campus. Okay. Uh, the va value-added tax is sometimes also called the ad valorem tax, so it's charged on the value, so ad valorem tax. Um, and uh, similar to taxes, we can also consider subsidies that are ad valorem subsidies. So uh, an ad valorem su subsidy would be then uh, a factor times the price, and now this factor is smaller than one, so you get essentially a discount. So an example of ad valorem subsidies are discounts. Any kind of um, uh, discount on the val value is um, is an ad valorem subsidy. Okay, so discounts are also something that we meet quite frequently and often they come in form of an ad valorem subsidy. So th these are taxes and subsidies uh, charged on prices or on the um, or in, in connection with prices on the essentially on the left hand side of the budget inequality. Now we can also consider taxes and subsidies on the right hand side of the budget inequality, so on the income. Um, the lump sum tax is a tax that is charged on the income, it's basically lump sum, so it's charged no matter how much you consume of which good, uh, you basically have to pay this tax, so it's a, it's, it's a lump sum tax, it's charged as a lump sum. Okay? So this would be then M minus T, and T is then the tax, again tax is a, is a positive, uh, the T is a positive number. And the lump sum subsidy would be um, M plus T, so you get something on top of your budget. Okay, so so this is the lump sum subsidy. Okay, these are applications. One other application I want to look at is inflation. So how would inflation affect the budget set of the consumer? So here we have our diagram, just to recall. And now if we so usually um, inflation increases um, the prices. Okay. So here we assume that um, the price is increased by the factor 1 plus i, so i is the inflation rate. And if you talk about inflation, then i is strictly positive. Okay. So the, the new price of good 1 after the inflation would be 1 plus i uh, times p1. And um, it increases not just 1, uh, or the, the 
that's not uh, not just increase the price of one good, but also of the of good two. So then it would be the new price for good two after inflation would be one plus i times p two. Okay. Now, so it increases price for goods, but your income you usually earn through wages, and your wage is also a price. Okay, so it's your, it's the price of your la labor. It would be also inflated. So then we should consider actually an increased income one plus i times m. So this income is increased by the factor one plus i. So it's also inflated. Okay. So in this sense, inflation could increase both the prices and the income. So the left hand side of your budget inequality and the right hand side. Now how would this affect the budget inequality? So we can we can put in the new prices and the new income in our budget inequality and what do we get? Well we get 1 plus i times p1 times x1 so this would be the spending on good 1 at the inflated price for good 1. Then we have 1 plus i pl uh, times p2 times x2 this is the spending on good 2 after after we face the inflated price for good 2. So this would be our total spending on consumption after inflation. And this is now smaller than 1 plus i times m, our inflated income. Okay, so even after inflation we cannot spend more than than we have. Okay, so we are constrained by the income available for consumption, the inflated income available for consumption. Now no, notice that um, we have 1 plus i on both sides. Okay, so what we could do is we could divide by 1 plus i. Okay, and then actually uh, 1 plus i cancels on both sides. So what we get is is our old budget equation, our earlier budget equation of the our earlier budget inequality. P1 times x1 plus P2 times x2 is smaller equal m. Okay, so this is our old budget inequality. So it just means so this is equivalent to that, okay, because one plus i cancels. So so since these two budget inequalities are the same, it must be that inflation doesn't affect the consumer and actually our budget line stays the same and also our budget set stays the same. Okay, so essentially inflation does not affect the budget set of the consumer. Okay. Now here we talked about inflation, so this is an increase um, by a factor of 1 plus i. We could also look, and, and i was strictly positive, we can also look at deflation, and deflation would be um, the case where i would be negative. Okay, But it would affect the budget in the same way, namely it wouldn't affect the budget at all. We have seen that inflation does not affect the consumer, because it inflates both sides of the budget inequality. On one hand, it inflates the prices, and on the other hand, it inflates the income. So it cancels out. Now, is it really the case that inflation does not affect the consumer? I'm from Germany. Germany suffered from a hyperinflation in 1923. My grandmother gave me some bills from the time that I would like to share with you. Here are 1 million Reichsmark. This is a bill of 1 million Reichsmark from 1923. This is a bill of 2 million Reichsmark. This is a bill of 10 million Reichsmark. This is a bill of 20 million Reichsmark. This is a bill of 50 million Reichsmark. And this is a bill of 100 million Reichsmark. And the final bill I would like to share with you, this is a bill of 10 billion Reichsmark. Can you imagine? 10 billion Reichsmark. Okay? Now, look how shabby this bill looks like. There's nothing even printed on the back. 
it's a very cheap printing and it's even issued by a, a local authority, not by the Reichsbank, the German Central Bank at the time. So what happened? Well, inflation was so high that prices changed during the day. You may have earned some wages during the day, some income, but in the evening prices went up already. And if you want to buy something, then the, the, the value of your income actually was less. So inflation affected the consumers because it affected um, the sides of the budget inequality at different times. So this is actually how inflation can affect consumers and we should keep this in mind. The next point I would like to discuss is rationing. Rationing refers to a situation where a consumer cannot buy more than a particular amount of one good. So he is rationed, okay, because he cannot buy everything that, that he wants of this good. So, um, so suppose the consumer is not allowed to buy more of good one than some amount x upper bar one. Okay, so x upper bar one stands for some amount of good one. Okay, some particular amount of good one. So then, in this case, we would say that the consumer is rationed to amounts of good one that are below x upper bar one. So how can we think of it in our budget model? Well, um, we have here the amount of x one. Okay, and now x upper bar one could be somewhere here, and uh, basically any amount above x upper bar one he couldn't buy. So it's not feasible anymore. He couldn't afford it. It's not because he doesn't have the money to afford it, but basically he's not allowed to afford it. Okay, so he could be x upper bar one. Okay, so here could be x upper bar one, and now basically for any consumption bundle in this triangle here. This is now infeasible because he's not allowed uh, to buy more than x upper bar 1 and any point in this triangle would involve more of consumption of good 1 than x upper bar 1. Okay, so his budget set then is, um, is, um, um, is um, basically does not contain these points anymore. Okay, and um, his budget set then is essentially this uh, blue shaded area here. So it's the original budget. Bu it's the original budget set where we cut off this triangle um, here. Okay. So this, of course, is a subset of the original budget set. So ra ra rationing uh, um, basically makes the consumer eventually worse off because there are now consumption bundles that he cannot uh, afford anymore and that he could have afforded before. Okay. Now, what happens is that if there's rationing, uh, so if, if consumers are not allowed uh, are not, are not allowed to buy more of a particular good than some amount, then it could be that um, if they want to actually buy more than this allowed amou amount, so if they w if this consumer w wants to buy more than x upper bar, then he he may wants to go to some other people to a, to a black market eventually where he could buy it. So he's, he's not allowed to buy more than x upper bar 1, but perhaps there is some kind of illegal market where he could buy it. So what, what, uh, what happens with rationing is that uh, it gives ri rise to a black market, and in this black market uh, presumably uh, these goods w would be more expensive. So the so good 1 in this case would be more expensive. Okay, so then uh, he would face um, the price of good 1 that is, um, of course, given by the slope of the bu budget line up to um, up to uh, the amount that he can buy. But if he wants to buy an amount more than x upper bar 1, uh, then he would face actually a higher price of good 1 because he now has to buy it in a black market and in a black market the price would be higher. So how can we think of it in terms of our budget model? Well, um, um, then um, basically he would face this higher price, p1 prime and um, so the the slope of the budget line would change at x upper bar 1 and it would become steeper here because uh, p1 prime is bigger than uh, p1 okay so here we have the original slope minus p1 over p2 
and for this segment of the budget line we would have a slope of minus p1 prime over p1 uh, uh, minus p1 prime over p2 so this basically gives you an idea how we could uh, study rationing and uh, rationing and the black market um, in our budget model you may find rationing not very relevant nowadays because in a market economy you hardly find situations where you are rationed in the consumption of some goods. I'm from East Germany originally. East Germany is a former socialist country and it had a plant economy. Now in a plant economy prices don't play the same role like in a market economy. In a market economy prices reflect scarceness of a good. Now in a plant economy prices are set by a central planning authority and it could be that there are goods that are relatively scarce but they have a low price. So when people try to buy them they couldn't buy them. Now what happened then was that people had to queue for example. If, uh, if suddenly this good was sold and people queued uh, so they actually had to pay not just the price for the good, but they would also have to pay for waiting there, for, for waiting in line. So, so this was sometimes the case for bananas, for example. Now, uh, what also happened that if, if there were goods that you wanted, but you couldn't buy them, then maybe you tried to buy them at the black market, or you bartered against some other goods. So you have a situation where uh, you have rationing and um, also different prices uh, if you if you want to go beyond the goods that you were allowed to buy. I want to finish this chapter with a discussion of an example. The example is the food stamp program in the US. The food stamp program was introduced in order to help uh, to improve the welfare of the poor and to improve their nutrition. Um, it uh, was introduced in, in 1964 with the Food Stamp Act and there the US federal government provides subsidies on food for poor people. Uh, this program has been reformed a couple of times. So uh, pre-1979, so before 1979, um, a family of four can receive a maximum monthly allotment of $153 in food coupons um, and they have to pay something for these food coupons but what they pay depends on their monthly income. So here in this example if a monthly income is $300 so this is uh, pre-79 so remember the, the time so if the monthly income is uh, $300 then they would have to pay $83 for the full allotment of $153 worth of food stamps. So we can think of this as an ad valorem subsidy on food and I think this will become clear. Um, now um, after 79 uh, uh, there was a reform so um, and uh, this reform was as follows so um, there basically people didn't need to buy these food stamps anymore they could simply uh, or they, no, they would simply receive these food stamps. Okay? So of course it will sti still depend on the on the income of the people, but uh, suppose that um, a comparable household would receive $200 uh, worth of food stamps. Um, then um, ah, the one condition basically was also that uh, they cannot resell these food stamps. Okay. So the question I want to ask is now: How can we study this? How can we analyze this with our simple budget model? Okay. So here we have a kind of policy relevant situation and the question is can we can we analyze this with our budget model that we introduced okay so le let's consider first the situation before 79 um, now on on the x-axis I will denote the dollar amount of food so this is not the number of food items bought but basically the money spent on food Okay, so of course the price for money spent on food is then of course one because the price of a dollar is is a dollar. Okay, so here we denote basically the food already in terms of you know the amount of dollars spent on food, 
and on the y-axis on the y-axis here I will denote um, um, I, I, I will have the, the amount of dollars spent on other goods so this is a composite good okay um, now the budget line in this example for, for this family would be that okay so they have three hundred dollars income remember so when they spend uh, when they spend all these three hundred dollars on food then they could buy basically three hundred dollars worth of food okay and if they spend all the dollars worth on other goods uh, on, on, on other goods then they could buy basically three hundred dollars worth of other goods so this would be their budget line and the slope is of course minus one okay because both are denoted in dollar terms okay so they have same price essentially. Okay, so so now we want to see how the Food Stamp Act before 1979 uh, affects uh, this household. Um, so so remember, uh, basically, uh, this household could buy then um, uh, food stamps. Okay, it could buy a maximum allotment of food stamps for 83 dollars. So this 83 dollars then it wouldn't have available anymore to buy other goods because it invests in these food stamps and it would get then for this eighty-three dollars it would get hundred fifty-three dollars worth of food okay so it gives up eighty-three dollars to get hundred fifty-three dollars worth of food so the, the budget line for this segment would be like this okay so this would signify the rate of um, between uh, food and known food um, up to $153 worth of food and um, the slope of this part is basically minus 83 over 153 which is about minus 0 0.54 so this tells us that um, that um, roughly uh, for every dollar given up on consumption of other goods it could get roughly two dollars worth of food okay um, so it's a it's a good deal. It's a discount on food. Uh, um, actually, it's an ad valorem subsidy on on food. Okay. Now the the household may actually want to buy more than 153 dollars worth of food. Okay. And of course, this household can do this by basically uh, reducing its consumption of of other goods. Um, but uh, basically, for every additional dollar worth of food. Um, beyond this $153 worth of food, um, for any additional dollar, it would have to give up. Um, it would have to give up a, a dollar spent on other food. So, so this budget line then uh, from uh, $153 worth of food onwards would be basically a kind of shifted line of this. So would be this red line here, which is shifted, um, which is a shifted version of the green one. So it has the same slope, okay? So um, uh, signifying, so the slope basically would signify that it would face the same, um, the same trade-off as before in terms of so between food and non-food, okay? So um, so this is um, how um, the um, Food Stamp Act before 1979 would affect the budget of the consumer of course, uh, or of, of this household here, and of course this household is better off uh, with this Food Stamp Act because there are now uh, consumption bundles like this consumption bundle here that it couldn't have afforded before, so it, it couldn't afford it before because it's outside the budget uh, set before, but it's inside the budget set now after the, after the Food Stamp Act. Okay, so clearly the 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 consumer is better off. Okay, um, so now we want to see how the reform uh, affected um, the consumer. So we want to look at uh, past uh, or post ni 1979. Um, so post 1979. So so remember um, uh, post 79, the household was simply given 200 dollars worth of food. Okay, so basically um, here is two hundred dollars worth of food, and he was given basically food stamps worth uh, two hundred dollars uh, of food, but he couldn't resell this food. So how would the budget line look? Well, because uh, so so the budget line now would uh, would have this um, now would be horizontal in this segment. Okay, because um, because he couldn't basically um, um, he, he couldn't spend. Uh, this money on on other goods only on food, two hundred dollars. But then, if he if the household wants to uh, 
buy more than $200 worth of food, then he would face the old uh, trade-off, um, which basically is then a shifted, uh, so this blue line is a shifted version of this green line. Okay, So from there on the slope is again minus 1. Okay, So um, so you see basically how this reform affected um, the consumer or this household. And now even, um, uh, so after 79, um, the household is better off uh, because there are now consumption bundles like this consumption bundle here that he could afford uh, after 79 but he couldn't have afforded before 79. Okay, And of course he couldn't also have afforded it uh, before the Food Stamp Act was introduced. Okay, So, so this is um, a simple illustration how uh, such kind of program um, affects, the, um, um, affects the consumer or the household. Okay, and it, um, so it, it illustrates basically how we can use our simple budget model to study uh, policy relevant programs. So that's all for today. I hope you learned something about budget constraints. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye bye.